I never expected to find anything of real interest in my grandfather's attic. It was just another dreary Saturday afternoon, and I'd been tasked with the unenviable job of clearing out decades of accumulated junk. Dust motes danced in the weak light filtering through the grimy windows as I shifted boxes and old furniture. That's when I stumbled upon it. A battered leather journal, its pages yellowed with age, tucked away in an old steamer trunk. The name inside caught my eye immediately. Thomas Everett, my great-grandfather. I'd heard stories about him, of course. A decorated lieutenant in the Great War, they said. A hero but he'd died long before I was born, and the stories had always felt distant, unreal. Now, holding his journal in my hands, I felt a connection to the past I'd never experienced before. I settled down right there in the attic, brushing away cobwebs and perching on an old crate. As I began to read, I was transported back in time, to the mud and blood of the Western Front. Thomas's neat, Precise handwriting spoke of his deployment to the Somme in July of 1916. His words painted a vivid picture of a world I could scarcely imagine. The conditions he described were hellish. Trenches carved into the earth along the Somme River, a mockery of civilization in the midst of chaos. Thomas wrote of constant rain that turned the ground to a quagmire, of mud that seemed to have a life of its own, sucking at boots and swallowing equipment. The threat of enemy fire was ever-present. A deadly game of chance played out every moment of every day. I found myself captivated by Thomas's descriptions of his comrades. He wrote often of Edward, a British soldier who'd become a close friend despite their different backgrounds. I could almost see them huddled in the trench, sharing a cigarette and dreams of home between bursts of gunfire. Thomas's words brought their camaraderie to life a bright spot in the darkness of war. One entry described a particularly harrowing night. Thomas and Edward had been tasked with setting up razor wire in no man's land, that terrible stretch of earth between the opposing trenches. I held my breath as I read, feeling the tension in every carefully penned word. They worked in near total darkness, every sound magnified, every shadow a potential threat. Thomas wrote of the corpses they encountered bloated and rotting, grim reminders of the fate that could await them at any moment. The next entry hit me like a physical blow. An artillery attack, sudden and devastating. Thomas's usually neat handwriting was shaky, the pages stained with what I realized. With a jolt, might be tears. Edward was gone, torn apart by a shell as they worked. The matter-of-fact way Thomas described the scene only made it more horrifying. I had to put the journal down for a moment, my heart racing as I tried to imagine the trauma of witnessing such a thing. When I picked up the journal again, I found a letter Thomas had written to someone named Margaret. From the tone, I guessed she might be his wife, or perhaps a sweetheart back home. The contrast between his words to her and his private thoughts in the journal was stark. To Margaret, he spoke of duty and honor, of missing home but standing strong. But I could see the cracks in his facade, the struggle to convey the true horrors he was witnessing while trying to maintain a brave face. As I reached the end of the first few weeks of entries, I realized I was holding my breath. The journal had pulled me in completely, making the events of over a century ago feel immediate and raw. Thomas' experiences were so far removed from anything I'd ever known, yet his words made them viscerally real. I knew I had to continue, to see this through to the end. Whatever horrors awaited in the pages ahead, I owed it to Thomas, and to myself, to bear witness to his story. With a deep breath, I turned the page, ready to delve deeper into the nightmare of the psalm. Little did I know that the true horrors were yet to come, and that Thomas's war was about to take a turn into realms I could never have imagined. As I delved deeper into Thomas's journal, the horrors of the psalm seemed to leap off the pages. His entries became more fraught with tension, each word a testament to the growing strain of life in the trenches. But nothing could have prepared me for what came next. It was a night in early August, according to Thomas's meticulous dating. He'd drawn night watch duty, a task he described with a mix of dread and relief. Dread for the oppressive darkness, 
and constant threat of enemy action, but relief for the relative quiet that allowed for moments of reflection. Little did he know that this particular night would change everything. Thomas's handwriting, usually so neat and controlled, grew jagged as he recounted what he'd seen. At first, I thought he must have dozed off and had a nightmare. But as I read on, the vivid details and raw emotion convinced me that whatever Thomas had witnessed, it had been all too real to him. He wrote of a strange disturbance in no man's land a movement that at first he took for a night raid. But as he watched, straining his eyes in the dim moonlight, he realized it was something else entirely. A creature, he wrote, unlike anything he'd ever seen before. It emerged from the Somme River, its form indistinct and otherworldly, moving with a fluidity that defied natural laws. Thomas described how the creature slithered across no man's land, navigating the treacherous terrain with eerie ease. It approached the carcass of a bear, likely caught in the crossfire of the human conflict, and began to feed. The details Thomas provided were grotesque, painting a picture of a monstrous entity consuming its prey in a manner both alien and horrifying. I found myself pausing frequently as I read, my mind struggling to reconcile Thomas's account with reality. Was this the product of an exhausted, traumatized mind? A hallucination brought on by the stress of war, or had Thomas truly witnessed something beyond human understanding? Before I could fully process this disturbing entry, the journal took another dark turn. Thomas wrote of a massive gas attack that left scores of soldiers dead or dying. The clinical way he described the effects of the gas, the choking, the blistering, the blind panic, made it all the more horrifying. Thomas himself was injured in the attack, though he survived where many others didn't. The next few entries were fragmented and confused, clearly written while Thomas was in the grip of pain and fever. He drifted in and out of consciousness, his words a jumble of present suffering and past horrors. The incident with the creature from the psalm began to feel like a distant nightmare, overshadowed by the very real nightmare of war. As Thomas recovered, his writing grew clearer, but a new note of unease had crept in. He wrote of returning to duty, of the grim determination of the men around him. But underneath it all, I could sense a growing dread, a fear of something beyond the German lines and artillery fire. Then came the entry that made my blood run cold. Thomas, on another night watch, witnessed not one but multiple creatures emerging from the river. His description was more detailed this time leaving no doubt in my mind that he believed wholly in what he was seeing. These entities, whatever they were, came to feed on the corpses littering no man's land, a grotesque feast that Thomas was forced to watch in helpless horror. In a moment of desperate need for connection, Thomas wrote that he'd confided in another soldier, a man named Simmons. To Thomas's surprise and relief, Simmons didn't dismiss his story. Instead, he claimed to have seen similar horrors himself. I found myself wondering about Simmons, about what he might have witnessed that would make him believe such an incredible tale. As I reached the end of this section of the journal, I felt a chill run down my spine. Thomas's war had taken a turn into territory I couldn't have imagined. The horrors of battle were being compounded by something else, something that defied explanation. I hesitated before turning the page both dreading and eager to learn what would happen next. Whatever terrors awaited in the coming entries, I knew I had to see Thomas's story through to the end. As I turned the page, I could feel the weight of Thomas's experiences pressing down on me. The next entries in his journal marked a descent into something far darker than I could have imagined. It began with voices. Thomas wrote of hearing whispers at first, barely audible above the constant rumble of artillery and the moans of the wounded. He dismissed them initially, attributing the sounds to exhaustion and the tricks the mind can play in the midst of war. But as days passed, the voices grew louder, more insistent. They seemed to emanate from the psalm itself, a chilling chorus rising from the muddy waters that had already claimed so many lives. The demands of these voices chilled me to the bone. Feed us, they whispered. Bring us more.
Thomas's handwriting grew increasingly erratic as he documented his struggle to understand what was happening to him. Was he losing his mind? Or was there something truly malevolent lurking in the river, hungry for the flesh and souls of soldiers? I found myself pausing frequently as I read, trying to imagine the toll this psychological torment must have taken on my great-grandfather. He wrote of sleepless nights, of the constant battle to focus on his duties while the voices gnawed at the edges of his sanity. The thought of sharing his experiences with others crossed his mind more than once, but fear of being labeled a madman always held him back. As if the supernatural horrors weren't enough, the physical realities of war intensified around Thomas and his fellow soldiers. He described artillery barrages that seemed to shake the very foundations of the earth, each shell bringing with it the possibility of instant obliteration. The constant fear of death from above added another layer to the nightmare Thomas was living. But it was the rain that truly began to terrify him. What had once been merely an uncomfortable aspect of trench life took on a sinister quality in Thomas's mind. The trenches flooded, the rising water a constant reminder of the river's presence. In his more paranoid moments, Thomas wondered if the Somme itself was orchestrating these events, manipulating the weather to claim more victims for whatever hungry entities dwelled within its depths. I felt a chill run down my spine as I read Thomas's increasingly frantic entries. He began to see patterns where there were none, ascribing malicious intent to every misfortune that befell his unit. A soldier slipping in the mud and breaking his leg became a deliberate act by the river to isolate its prey. A burst of shrapnel that killed three men was, in Thomas's mind, a sacrifice demanded by the voices. It was in this state of near madness that Thomas witnessed the breaking of Simmons, the soldier who had previously confided in him about the river creatures. Simmons, it seemed, had been fighting his own battle against the whispering horrors. But where Thomas had managed to cling to some semblance of sanity, Simmons finally snapped. Thomas's account of what happened next was almost too terrible to read. Simmons, wild-eyed and raving about feeding the river, attacked two of his fellow soldiers. In the confined space of the trench, the violence was swift and brutal. Before anyone could stop him, Simmons scrambled out of the trench and into no man's land. What followed was a scene of horror that would haunt Thomas for the rest of his life. Simmons, heedless of the danger, ran straight into a minefield. Thomas described in agonizing detail the sight of his friend being torn apart. Simmons's final screams drowned out by the explosions that claimed his life. As I read, I could almost hear the echoes of those screams, mingling with the ever-present whispers from the river. In the aftermath of Simmons's death, Thomas found the voices growing louder still. They seemed pleased by the sacrifice, yet ever hungry for more. The final entry of this section of the journal was perhaps the most chilling of all. Thomas, his resolve clearly weakening, wrote of considering the unthinkable, of contemplating how he might provide more sacrifices to appease the ravenous entities in the psalm. As I set the journal down, my hands shaking, I felt as though I had been transported to that hellish landscape of a century ago. The horrors Thomas had witnessed and the madness that threatened to consume him felt painfully real. I found myself both dreading and needing to know how his story would end. With a deep breath, I steeled myself to read on, to bear witness to the final chapter of Thomas Everett's war against both human and inhuman enemies. As I turned to the final pages of Thomas's journal, I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. The descent into madness I had witnessed through his words had been harrowing, but I knew the worst was yet to come. The entries that followed were a testament to a mind pushed beyond its limits, grappling with horrors both real and imagined. Thomas's handwriting, once so neat and precise, had devolved into a chaotic scrawl that at times was barely legible. His thoughts jumped erratically from one subject to another, the coherent narrative of earlier entries giving way to a stream of consciousness that was difficult to follow. Yet through it all, one theme remained constant, the ever-present voices from the song, demanding to be fed. I read with growing dread as Thomas began to eye his fellow soldiers not as comrades, but as potential offerings to appease the river's hunger. He wrote of calculating which men would be least missed, 
of contemplating how he might lure them into no man's land under the cover of darkness. The clinical detachment with which he discussed these plans chilled me to the bone. This was not the decorated war hero I had heard stories about. This was a man pushed to the very brink of sanity. Yet even in the depths of his madness, some part of Thomas seemed to recognize the horror of what he was contemplating. Entries filled with plans for sacrificial offerings would suddenly give way to passages of self-loathing and despair. He wrote of his shame, of his fear that he was betraying everything he had ever believed in. In these moments of clarity, the full weight of his experiences seemed to crash down upon him. It was during one of these lucid periods that Thomas made a fateful decision. If the voices would not leave him in peace, he would confront them directly. He wrote of his plan with a mix of determination and resignation, as if he knew he was signing his own death warrant, but could see no other way out. The entry describing Thomas's venture into no man's land was almost unbearable to read. He chose a night when artillery fire was particularly heavy, using the chaos as cover for his madness-driven mission. As shells exploded around him, illuminating the blasted landscape in brief, terrifying flashes, Thomas made his way towards the Somme. His description of that journey was a nightmarish blend of real horrors and hallucinations. He wrote of crawling over corpses and through tangles of barbed wire, all the while feeling as if the very earth beneath him was alive and hungry. The voices grew louder with each step, a cacophony of demands and promises that threatened to drown out all rational thought. Just as Thomas reached the banks of the Somme, ready to confront whatever eldritch horrors awaited him there, fate intervened in the form of an artillery shell. The explosion threw him through the air, and for a moment, he wrote, all was silent. The constant whispers that had plagued him for so long were finally, mercifully quiet. When Thomas regained consciousness, he found himself in a field hospital, both legs gone below the knee. The physical pain, he wrote, was excruciating, but it paled in comparison to the relief he felt at escaping the maddening influence of the song. Whether the supernatural horrors he had experienced were real or a product of a war-ravaged mind, they seemed to have released their hold on him. The final entries in the journal were fragmented, written over the course of several days as Thomas drifted in and out of consciousness. He reflected on his experiences with a mix of confusion and lingering terror. Part of him still believed in the reality of what he had seen and heard, while another part questioned every memory, wondering how much had been real and how much a product of trauma and exhaustion. As I closed the journal, my mind reeling from everything I had read, I found myself grappling with my own questions. What had my great-grandfather really experienced in the trenches of the Somme? Were the horrors he described merely the hallucinations of a man pushed beyond endurance by the brutality of war? Or had he genuinely encountered something beyond human understanding? Some ancient evil awakened by the unprecedented bludge of the Great War. I realized that I might never know the full truth of Thomas Everett's war. But as I sat there in the dusty attic, surrounded by the relics of the past, I felt a profound connection to the man whose experiences I had just shared. Whatever the reality behind his story, Thomas had survived both the physical and psychological horrors of his time on the Somme. His resilience, his struggle to maintain his humanity in the face of unimaginable trauma, filled me with a sense of awe and deep respect. As I carefully closed the journal, I knew that Thomas's story would stay with me for the rest of my life. It served as a powerful reminder of the cost of war, not just in lies lost, but in the enduring trauma inflicted on those who survive. And perhaps, just perhaps, it hinted at darker truths lurking beneath the surface of our world, waiting to be awakened by the madness of human conflict.